The um, area that we're talking about is the village of Fairview. And within that village there were two racetracks. Of significance is the Detroit Driving Club which opened on July 17th of 1894. This racetrack opened exclusively for horses at its inception, but a significant event occurred on October 10th of 1901. And that introduced automobile racing to Michigan and to the Detroit area. This racetrack located in the village of Fairview, Gross Point Township, Wayne County, Michigan. Alexander Winton was building automobiles for almost a decade, had a reputation in, race, in racing circles and uh, was the car of the day. If you owned an automobile, it would be a Winton. On this occasion, on October 10th of 1901, a compendium of automobiles, gas-driven, electric, and steam, were set to compete at the significant event. In a field uh, starting out of five for gas-driven automobiles, this field ended up becoming a two-man race between Alexander Winton and an unknown named Henry Ford. Ford up to this point had a reputation of being somewhat eccentric, had uh, worked for two automobile companies, the Detroit Automobile Company, and one bearing his name, but only his name, the Henry Ford Company. The vehicle he used for the race on October 10th of 1901 was manufactured by the Detroit Automobile Company. Henry Ford didn't own it. He borrowed it for the race, got into the race at the 11th hour, and competed against Alexander Winton. On the eighth lap of a race that was intended on going at least 10 laps, Winton's car broke down, and Henry Ford won the race. The race launched the modern-day Ford Motor Company. That race established Henry Ford on the world stage. As uh, things would go, the unknown became the known, and Alexander Winton faded into obscurity. The vehicle that Ford used was called Sweepstakes. It was designed, as I said before, by the Detroit Automobile Company. Henry Ford uh, used Sweepstakes and uh, this vehicle later on becoming rather interesting enough the model for what became Cadillac Motor Car Company. Henry Leland took over as the uh, design engineer at Detroit Automobile Company which later changed its name to Cadillac in 1903. So this vehicle that Ford drove even though he was behind the wheel and he designed it was not a Ford. It became Cadillac. The Winton vehicle later on became part of General Motors in 1925. So what you see are the two uh, primitive automobiles for the General Motors company, not necessarily for Ford. Interesting enough, the location. The location of this racetrack between Connor Avenue and Lenox off of Jefferson Avenue uh, became the embryonic uh, location of the Detroit automobile industry along the Jefferson Corridor. Later on, the E.R. Thomas Motor Company would uh, find property at Clearpoint and Froude, and E.R. Thomas would later become the Chalmers Detroit, later to become Chalmers, later to become Chrysler. So we see the antithesis of the automobile company starting in this location in proximity to the Detroit Driving Club. The race, in all its significance, launched the automobile in the Detroit metro area. The racetrack itself, as I said before, it, it got its uh, inaugural run on July 17th of 1894 for horses, for thoroughbred racing and for harness racing. The track has three lives. First, as uh, a horse venue. The second, becoming the location for automobile racing. And the third life, and its last being the first test track. So from 1911 until 1919 it operated as a test track for Hudson Motor Car Company, the Chalmers Motor Car Company, Lozier, Hop, Hudson, and a host of others that wanted to find out how the vehicles 
would uh, operate under, under different driving conditions. So you have the granddaddy here of automobile testing at, at the Detroit Driving Club. The land of the Detroit Driving Club was owned by Daniel J. Campo Jr. This is the same Campo of the Campo family going back to Joseph Campo. DJ Campo Jr known nationally in horse racing circles. This was his avocation. Another part of Mr. Campo's life was being very active in Democratic Party politics. This family at one time held the majority wealth in the state of Michigan. Very wealthy, very influential in, in politics, uh, in the uh, uh, horse racing circles, and now with the advent of the automobile for uh, car manufacturing. So what you have here is a combination of, of big names. DJ Campo Jr., Henry Ford, Alexander Winton. Uh, we also want to bring in names like uh, George Hendry. Hendry had property in the area, also a competing racetrack called the Detroit Jockey Club. Jockey Club being located between Lakewood Avenue and Alter Road, the entrance at Marlboro. Significance of, of Marlboro to the area that it is a brick paved street. For two blocks, you have brick. This is an anomaly because it doesn't exist anymore as, as a means of paving streets. It's labor intensive, so it's very unique. Why two streets having brick pavement in this area on Detroit's east side? This was the entrance of the Detroit Jockey Club. The brick had a practical function. It served to support rails for a streetcar access. The streetcar would move to and fro from Jefferson Avenue into the Detroit Jockey Club, moving spectators. So it had a practical function. It wasn't for aesthetics, it was for functionality. So the streetcar would, would move people back and forth. George Hendry was also considered the father of the Detroit streetcar system in Detroit. His first uh, uh, company, the Detroit City Streetcar, was established just uh, after the, the Civil War. So you had uh, this gentleman moving people back and forth by street rail, first horse driven and then later electric, and then combining a variety of independent streetcar systems that emerged into what became Detroit United Rail. We're in Gross Point Park. Gross Point Park 100 years ago was part of the village of Fairview. The legend that stands behind me identifies an incident that occurred here in 1712 involving the Sac Fox Indians, the French Garrison, the Ottawa, the Huron, and affiliated tribes with the uh, French Garrison. The uh, epicenter of this event took place a little west of where we're at right now and it, needless to say it was significant in that a thousand casualties of the uh, Fox Sac Nation were sustained. Those remains are still buried in the grounds as this was the Grand Marais during that period of time. So where they died they were buried another legacy of what exists at a time of the uh, village of Fairview. We're at the channel of where the Detroit River flows right into Lake St. Clair. Just across the water here is Peach Island. And Peach is spelled P-E-C-H-E, pesh, for fish. On that island, the uh, shaman for Chief Pontiac is buried. And it's a secret of where he's buried because the man had mystical powers of some sort. But where we are right now, where we're doing this uh, taping, is an area where uh, the lighthouse existed that uh, directed traffic along the water. This lighthouse is automated. It's the third generation lighthouse on this uh, particular piece of real estate. We're close to sacred ground because in 1712, 
an incident occurred uh, that cost the lives of a, at least a thousand Sac Fox Indians. Uh, this tribe uh, kind of retreated, well they did retreat from the siege that they had at Fort Pontchartrain and then were ambushed by a garrison of French and uh, allied with Iroquois and Miami and Huron and essentially uh, took out a thousand of the Sac and the Fox. Uh, it's very uh, uh, interesting, the uh, area became a burial ground for these casualties and as such in Indian Native American culture is considered sacred ground. So that's what we're standing on. It's very nice. We have a beautiful day here. We have a good view of the, of the river and we have a bit of uh, history to lend to uh, what existed in this area. Okay, we're on Frood, F-R-E-U-D, and it is Frood. Those folks came from uh, Germany, and uh, Sigmund Freud came from Austria, so in dialect, it is Frood. The other cross street is Lycast. That's also a surname for a property owner that existed here in the old Fairview area. Right across the street from us is an airplane hangar, and how bizarre, because we see surrounded uh, this airplane hangar are boats. But folks, this is where the original location of Detroit City Airport existed. And it was here from 1922 until 1925, and then relocated to Connor just at Gratiot Avenue. But this building bears the original markings of what an airplane hangar looked like back in the early 1920s. In the background, we see what is left of the Detroit Edison smokestacks. Uh, originally it was uh, called the Seven Sisters and Two Brothers and we only have two brothers left of that power station that was built in 1911. Once again it was designed to power an entire area of what was considered Old Fairview and this is what it looks like now. So we have uh, boat storage in an area that once had airplanes as its mainstay. Here we are at Newport and Jefferson. This is the location of the Vanity Ballroom. Vanity opened in 1927. State of the art of its day with a floating dance floor. Artists such as Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Glenn Miller, Tommy Dorsey, Jimmy Dorsey were all featured at this dance emporium. And as of late, it's become the backdrop even for Eminem in his movie Eight Mile. The Vanity stands derelict and abandoned. The marquee is gone and the glitz has faded. All part of a neighborhood that had a vibrancy that the Vanity Brawl Room stood as a gem. St. Martin's Parish was established in 1924. The first building to be built no longer exists. It was the uh, school and church that existed. This building was built in 1950 to accommodate at its uh, zenith uh, 2,000 families that lived in this neighborhood. The uh, style of architecture is reminiscent of uh, uh, French. Uh, Gothic and uh, the uh, building really doesn't do justice unless you had a chance to see the interior which was equally as uh, astounding. Uh, unfortunately due to the uh, changes in the uh, population of the uh, Catholic uh, parish uh, the building is uh, closed and scheduled for demolition. I can even read right off the ledger. This is the Fisher Mansion built by Lawrence Fisher 
one of the seven Fisher brothers. Fisher was responsible for introducing style to General Motors by hiring a gentleman named Harley Earl, who up to that point in time de developed custom-made vehicles for Hollywood stars. This mansion is in the uh, old Fairview area. It was built on property that was once owned by Edward Gray, who tried to develop this area as Gray Haven. And you can see by the legend on the historic sign that this is a significant item located in the Jefferson Chalmers east side of Detroit area. We're in front of the Joseph Guyton School, located at 355 Phillip in Detroit. Joseph Guyton came from Everett, Michigan, and that's just a little south of Cadillac, Michigan, if you're familiar with the northern part of the state. Guyton was the first American casualty in World War I. The school opened in 1923, and where we're at right now happens to be the midfield area of what was long ago called the Detroit Jockey Club a racetrack that existed here for horse racing. And Joseph Guyton uh, was as far away from that as you could possibly be. But uh, Guyton being uh, the soldier that he was, served his country and uh, died in service to the country, uh, the first American to die as a casualty of World War I. Very interesting that the schools that we're visiting, we visited the Trombley School in Gross Point Park, and uh, taking into consideration Guyton, this location. Another school which no longer exists, the, the Keating School, uh, in memory of uh, an alderman for the city of Detroit. And yet another school that doesn't exist, uh, just north of us, the Ives School, uh, named after Albert Ives, who was a banker. We have a soldier, as uh, defined here by uh, Joseph Guyton. We have a banker in Albert Ives, and we have uh, a politician uh, for Maurice Keaton. Three individuals who bear a connection to the Masonic Order, who represent banking, politics, and the military. Something to think about. This is Patterson Park, named for Matthew Patterson, who was the mayor of Gross Point Park. But in its history, it was called Cloverley at one point, and the estate of Hugh McMillan. Hugh McMillan was involved in uh, the lumber industry. His family also involved in the manufacture of rail cars. Hugh McMillan's estate sat closer to the water, and it was Hugh McMillan, along with Truman Newberry, that brought electricity into this area of uh, Gross Point Township and more uh, precisely into the village of Fairview in 1904. We're just off of Mack Avenue on what is now a service drive. The new overpass for Mack is just beyond me. But just behind me are buildings, all that's left of what in the early days of the automobile industry contributed as suppliers to the infant automobile industry. A little ways to my west is where Lozier Manufacturing was located. In fact, at the corner of St. Jean and Mack. Briggs Manufacturing existed in here. The Gray Motor Car Company was located just a couple of doors down. And of course, all this now falling victim to the decline in uh, an industry that supported all these businesses. So, all we have left now is the ancient ruins of uh, the Detroit automobile business as it existed on the east side, just outside of the Fairview area. Randy, I'm 
Grand River. Do you remember what was this store right here? Cunningham. Cunningham. On the corner. <laughs> I got the, I looked at that old. He's got an old portrait of this right here. Like 1918. 1927. 1927. I'm thinking the who played up there opened up for Jimmy Hendrix. It was some group that opened up for the on the west side. There was no rock, no rock group ever featured. It never was. No. It was all big bands. Right. All big bands, and then they had they had a, a big band that was featured here during the 1970s before it closed. But essentially, it was it was big band music. It always was. right. But it was it some stars that come out of here or some or it, yeah or played in, in, in the 19 in the 1930s or 40s. Yeah. So it always been a band. I used to boogie up here, man. This used to be the biggest dance floor on the east side. It's just like they let floating, it go. Floating dance floor. Floating dance floor. Oh, they used to have a big beer bus disco. It was two guys that owned it. It was twin brothers. Right. That, was in, the, that was in the 70s. Right. But there was never any rock performance. No, no rockers. You go all the way back. You know this honey. Everybody don't know that used to be Cunningham's. People don't know that used to be the Secretary of State right there somewhere. Well, that used to, before that, it opened as a Sears Hardware in the bottom. Yeah. And then it became Fromm's Hardware. So what, are you the owner or are you just a historian? No, I know about the neighborhood. I'm the right. historian, yeah. What you know about, uh, used to be right there on the corner? <laughs> that used to be Kresge's right there. That's right. What used to be next Kresge? Sanders. <laughs> what used to be right there? All of this was a jeweler's store there, Ross. Nope, nope, nope. Ross Jewelers. No, no. Before, what was the store there? Well, that's Perry's. Right, what was next to Perry's? That was Cannon Shoes. Vincent Brothers. Before that, it was Cannon Shoes. You remember Justin and Charmers used to be right there? What about the police station right there? Mini station. That came late. That came much What later. about right there? Children's Corner. Yeah. <laughs> Children's Corner like a motherfucker, man. Okay, what well, we used to be on the corner right there? Uh, Charmers. Killer, yeah. Killer's Main Street. That hardware. It was a walk-in hardware. That hardware, before it became a hardware. Right. When that building opened up, in the 1920s, it was a Walgreens pharmacy. Walgreens pharmacy. Do you know that who building? Owned this whole that block? building. That building is older than this building. Do you remember who owned this whole block? He used to own Perry's in Italian. Big mafia. Yeah. His um, name was Gino. Yeah. Gino Scalisi. He, he had Gino's pieces right there. Right. <laughs> Next to Gino's pieces was That's uh, right. Good Housekeeping. That's right. And Singer's Owen. Yeah. Well, uh, you know the cleaner's been there for a while. Yeah. You remember it used to be what do you Edison? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. What used to be right here then? That was the hardware store. Next to no, the hardware store. Gas station. Yeah. Gas station on the corner was a Sinopra. Right, so it was. You remember Swing Bicycle Shop? Yeah, the Swing. Well, the original place was on um, Marlboro. Because that was. It was Bill's Bikes, that's what it was right, called. Right, so it was. Yeah. What used to sit on the corner of Arthur Road and uh, Jefferson? On this side. On, across on, the light. On this side? Yeah, right here on this side. We're talking about the bar? Yeah. The deck the, bar. The deck bar. <laughs> but, but before it was the deck bar, it was a band. What about that uh, store that used to be next to it? That little store, liquor store, the next to the deck bar? It was a liquor store. Yeah, that's store. right. That, that's, that's long gone. What used to be right across the street where the, uh, the BP at? What used to be there? You remember the liquor store used to be there in Mission Valley?